We don't need any more empty promises. Greta Thunberg rightly blasted everyone, words to the effect of, you've stolen my dreams and my childhood. And right here, right now, is where we draw the line. Right here, right now, is where finance draws the line. Mark Carney is one of the most prominent global voices calling for climate action around the world. The former governor of the Bank of Canada and Bank of England is also the UN Special Envoy on Climate Action and Finance. I spoke with him earlier last week about the climate crisis, wildfires, and of course the impact of higher interest rates on Canadians. Mark Carney, nice to see you. Appreciate you doing this. Thanks for having me, Rosemary. I, I want to start, obviously, with what we're seeing outside. Uh, unprecedented season of wildfires. That's what the government says. Um, as the UN Special Envoy on Climate Change, when you see this and the way it's impacting not only this country, but also now the US, what are your concerns about whether we're moving quickly enough on climate change? Well, uh, I guess the first thing to say is that this was predictable. In fact, it was predicted. And in fact, uh, unfortunately, it's going to get worse. Uh, mm -hmm. Even if we do succeed, we're we're at 1.1, 1.2 degrees of global warming. Uh, we're trying to limit it to one and a half degrees, but yeah. that's still a uh, deterioration from where we are today. And uh, and on current efforts, we're we're going to overshoot that. Uh, so uh, it's concerning, and uh, I, I think I'd observe as well that what we're been living through, and it's terrible. It's terrible human costs where the fires are, whether it's in Val d'Or sure. or Grand Prairie or uh, in <laughs> Sherburne County in Nova Scotia and across the country. Uh, but of course the the health costs that we're experiencing uh, over the course of, uh, of a few days. Now, this is what millions of people, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people live through today mm. around the world as well, which underscores the urgency of action. I want to ask you about one of the places that was affected by, by wildfire, that's Alberta, that just re-elected a UCP government with Daniel Smith. One of the things that she said the night that she was elected that she's very concerned about is a cap on oil and gas emissions. She's also concerned about the, um, the net zero electricity grid by 2030. And she told my colleague David Cochran that she believes that Canada can reach its climate goals without this cap. So, so first of all, I'd, I'd like to know whether you think that is doable um, and whether the technology that she seems to believe is coming on board can get Canada there without a cap. Okay. Uh, well, first thing, um, you know, the oil and gas sector in Canada produces more than a quarter of our emissions. Yeah. So just, and that's in the production and transportation of oil and gas, not the actual use of oil and gas, gas in our cars uh, used to uh, heat some homes and other things. Mm -hmm. um, so we can't meet our ultimate objectives, which is uh, to get to net zero emissions, which by the way is what we have to do to prevent the wildfires yeah, yeah. and the other climatic yeah. events from getting worse, what the world has to do. We can't get there unless we do not just have a cap on emissions, but uh, those emissions are brought effectively to zero. Now, so that's the, that's the climate physics. You don't need to be a meteorologist. You don't need yeah. to be a climate scientist. That, it's the simple math of it. Uh, now, the good news is we are an energy superpower. Uh, we have tremendous expertise, and we have the ability to make some enormous investments right there in Alberta to get those emissions down sure. um, so that that, uh, that energy that's produced, which is uh, needed and will be needed for, uh, for some time, uh, is low cost, low carbon and competitive. And that's what we need to do. Uh, uh, the Alberta government, the federal government, uh, private business, yeah. we need to work together in order to get that done. I want to ask you about uh, the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero. Thank you. It, it, <laughs> yes, it is one of your babies. It, it, it is, I don't know if the right word is struggling, but the um, insurance component of it, the insurance and companies seem to be backing away from it. Lloyd's of London was the last one, I think, the yep. sixth company in a number of days to, um, to say I, I, we're, we're concerned about this. And the reasons they seem to be citing are political uh, political concerns from the U.S. and also worries about uh, competition and competition laws. What what do you do then when a portion of your alliance is is seems to be very anxious uh, and 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 saying I, I we don't okay. think we can commit to this anymore? Does the whole alliance start to question no. what it's doing or or how yeah. do you how Where do you get go? them back on board? So yeah. so uh, first overall context. Uh, let's speak about the insurance yeah. bit there. It, it, it isn't two issues, it's one issue. It is a political attack on that alliance. Um, there is, uh, you know, 23 attorney generals all in a state of a certain yeah. political persuasion yeah. in the United States that's using, uh, yeah. that's using antitrust uh, as a weapon against uh, these. And 
but uh, it's working. And it's and it's working. Yeah. It's, it's and and that's because insurance is regulated at the state level, yeah. and there is a political element to that. There, there is a political overlay here, without question. Now, take a step back mm -hmm. for the alliance as a whole, uh, GFANS as a whole. It continues to grow. Uh, at Glasgow, it was 400 uh, major financial institutions. Now it's almost 600. Uh, at Glasgow, it was $130 trillion of assets, 70 times the yeah. size of the Canadian economy. Now it's $150 trillion of assets. We've just added a new uh, venture capital alliance. And what's happening, and this is the key thing, and it goes back to our economic discussion, is it's not just about commitments, but what's happening is the banks, the, uh, the asset managers, the investors are moving their investments towards those regions and those companies, those opportunities right. that are doing exactly what we were talking about a moment ago. They want to back car companies, they want to back provinces and, and countries that are moving down in their emissions. So the Bank of Canada again has, has raised interest, interest rates this past week and there is no talk that it will have to happen again. So I, I was asking you this before we started, to what extent should the Bank of Canada be considering inflation? and its goals on inflation, but also what's happening to Canadians, because this is starting to get kind of dire for some Canadians. Well, um, first, obviously, it's, as a former governor, I, um, I, I don't question the decisions of the Bank of Canada. I fully support uh, those decisions, and they've got a great governing council and uh, governor there. Um, uh, second thing is that the bank has a very clear mandate, which is to keep inflation low, yep. stable, predictable, so to get it back to that 2%. So, um, and they're accountable for that, and they have to act in that direction. But what they do is if they do take into account the impact on Canadians of this. First and foremost, the impact on Canadians of high and volatile inflation. Canadians um, deserve low, stable prices. Uh, they need to get it. It's been too high. It has to come down. It eats into their wages today. It makes them uncertain. Uh, and so the bank has to do what's necessary to get it down. In the third point, though, is in taking those actions, we have to take into account Canadian, many Canadians have a mortgage. Uh, those mortgage costs are, are going yeah. up. Um, are they, uh, how are they, Canadians going to adjust their own spending because of not just higher mortgage costs, but because of uncertainty around the economy? So when, when you hear the opposition leader saying we're headed for a mortgage default across the country, what do you say? Uh, I, well, I, I would say that's alarmist. I, I would say that's not grounded in the facts. Uh, look, um, Canadians um, have uh, taken out more uh, mortgage debt. Right. Canadians pay their debts. They're, they're, you know, they work hard, they pay their debts, and the banks can work with those Canadians who maybe in some cases have greater strains, lengthen the period of time for the mortgage, help yeah, them yeah. move through this period. And, and where we want to get to, and I think where we're headed, is Canadians deserve to see their wages growing faster than inflation, mm -hmm, so they're mm -hmm. making gains. Um, and that's why the bank, and we're just starting to get to that point as a whole, where wages are growing in you know, just under 5%, inflation's coming down into the fours. The bank wants to make sure that inflation goes all the way back to two, yeah. so Canadians start to make those gains, and that helps uh, with the overall situation. Okay, another big question, and I'll end on this, because as we end almost every interview, is, is politics. <laughs> um, have you had any conversations with people lately about whether you plan to run in a by-election if it were to become available? Uh, I can think of one in Ontario that could, near the Ottawa region, or in an election, a general, in the next general election. Like, are you telling people, yes, I'm in the next time, or not? Uh, look, I, I, I'll say this, which is that I focus on getting things done, and there's yeah. various ways to get things yes. done, uh, whether it's on climate change, whether it's on a reaction to AI, whether it's making sure our financial system's there uh, for Canadians. Uh, what path I take to do that, I mean, there's multiple paths. Sure. Uh, so it's about doing, not being. Uh, there's not specific roles, um, and, and I'll leave it at that. So I won't get an answer from you here. You, it's something that's on the table for you? Is that fair to say? The, uh, unless what, you let me, say let no me, right now, I'm going to ask you every time I talk to you. That's just the way journalists go. <laughs> I, it's, it's fair. Well, then, but that, I like it because you invite me back. Yeah, that's um, right. that's, um, and we talked about a number of really important sure. things in this discussion. Yeah. And I'll, I'll say this, and it came up a few times implicitly in our discussion, which is ultimately Canadians decide where we want to go. Canadian values decide yeah. how the market works uh, for on behalf of Canadians. And it is in part the work of politics to translate that into 
into objectives, into specific rules, laws, uh, and, and policies to uh, yeah. move us towards that. And there's various ways to help influence uh, that design. Some of it's technical, some of it's political. I've tended to be on the technical side uh, and bring it forward. At some point it may make sense, but we'll see. Ultimately it's about what's accomplished. Okay. And you know, we do have a plan, we're moving towards it, we just have to do more. Thank you for your time. Thank Appreciate you, Rosemary. <laughs> okay.